the sage and his beloved mountain inseparable the mightiness of the hill perfectly matched by the spiritual might of the sage what was the relationship between both revered as the mountain of fire and representing the element of agni arunachala symbolizes the highest knowledge the very core of the upanishads arunachala being one of the oldest rock formations on earth reinforces the ancient tradition that holds this mountain to be most sacred according to the puranas since the very beginning of creation those who seek the highest truth have been drawn inexorably by the deep mystical quality of the mountain and its timeless spiritual resplendence arunachala mahatmyam states that this mountain is lord shiva himself and that just to think of arunachala sets one on the path to liberation it also clearly states that only those whom shiva calls can come here and this was verified by shri ramana maharshi himself tiruchuri is a small village about 30 miles south of the famous pilgrim center of madurai in south india on the 30th of december 1879 in a small house opposite the bhuminateshwara temple which dominates the village venkataraman who was later to become bhagwan shri ramana maharshi was born this was the night of ardra darshan a day sacred to lord shiva as the deity re-entered the temple after the ceremonial procession the first cry of the child was heard from this room Bhagwan's father Sundaramayar an uncertified pleader was much revered by the people of the village and surrounding areas he was a man of integrity and even robbers respected him and left him untouched sundaramayar and his wife alagammal were both deeply religious they were noted for their generosity and they kept an open house where both pilgrims visiting the temple and the poor were invited to take food venkataraman the second of four children grew up as an average boy there was nothing particularly distinctive about his early years except that he was a deep sleeper for his elementary education he attended schools in tiruchuri and for a short time in dindigal In 1892 tragedy struck the family Venkataraman was just 12 years old when his father Sundaramayar died leaving the family to be cared for by his two younger brothers Alagamma and two of the children went to stay with Nellayappa Iyer who lived in Mana Madurai whilst Venkataraman and his elder brother Nagasami went to live with Subbaiyar in Madurai there he continued his education at the Scots Middle and American Mission High School it was apparently by accident that venkataraman heard about arunachala when he was 16 years of age one day an elderly relative of his called on the family in madurai the boy asked him where he had come from on hearing him mention arunachala a strange inexplicable wave of emotion swept the boy's heart he then asked what from arunachala where is it 
and the relative replied that Arunachala was Thiruvannamalai. The act of destiny had begun. Sometime in July 1896, when Venkataraman was sitting on the first floor of his uncle's house, a sudden and unmistakable fear of death took hold of him. He felt he was going to die. But, instead of panicking, Venkataraman calmly set out to solve the mystery of death itself. He proceeded to find out what it was that died. In a flash, it dawned on him that death was for the body alone. The true being has no death. For the young lad, such realization was not the result of logical thinking. There was no time involved in the process. The supreme reality, Satchitananda, that is ever present, was revealed. From that day onwards, Venkataraman lost all interest in outward life. A studied indifference characterized his behavior. Previously, he would go routinely to the Meenakshi temple and stand before the deities. But now, he began spending more time there. He would stand silently before the images of Nataraja, Meenakshi, and the 63 Tamil saints. And as he stood there, tears would flow copiously from his eyes. On the 29th of August, 1896, Venkataraman was carrying out an imposition in Bain's grammar given to him by his English teacher. Suddenly, he realized the futility of this and laying aside the books, he sat bolt upright with eyes closed in inner absorption. His elder brother Nagasami, who was watching Venkataraman's behavior, admonished him, saying, Why should one who behaves thus retain all this? His meaning was quite clear. Why should one who preferred meditation to his social duties continue to stay in society and profess to go on with study? Such expressions had been used several times during the previous weeks by his elder brother, but they had not been taken seriously. This time, however, it went straight to Venkataraman's heart. Yes, he thought, what my brother says is true. What is the purpose of my remaining here any longer? Immediately, the thought of Arunachala that had given him a thrill in the previous November came to the forefront and filled him with an all-consuming urge to leave. Is this not the all-powerful calling me? Yes, he decided. This is the call of Arunachala. He sought for a means to go to Arunachala, but it must be done secretly and it must not be within the power of his relatives to trace him and drag him back. He told his brother that he had a special class at school and that he had to go. The brother gave him five rupees and asked him to pay his college fees on the way. Providence had now provided Venkataraman with the means to travel. He hastily turned to an old atlas for the route, but this did not disclose the villapuram Thiruvannamalai branch railway line opened in 1892. He noted from the atlas that Tindivanam railway station was the nearest to Thiruvannamalai, and surmising that three rupees would suffice to carry him to Tindivanam, he left the balance of two rupees with a letter amidst his brother's books and set off for the railway station. I have in search of my father and in obedience to his command started from here. This is only embarking on a virtuous enterprise. Therefore, none need grieve over this affair. 
To trace this out, no money need be spent. Your college fee has not yet been paid. Two rupees are enclosed herewith. Thus. The journey itself was an incredible drama conducted by the Lord Himself. He hurried to the station, fearing that he had missed the train, but found that it was also late. He purchased a ticket to Thindivanam and waited for the train to arrive. It was midday. After boarding the train, he was told by a kind Muslim gentleman that he could actually alight at Villipuram to continue his journey to Thiruvannamalai. After alighting at Villapuram, Venkataraman searched for the road to Tiruvannamalai but could not find it. Hungry and exhausted, he stopped at a hotel and took food. When he offered payment for the meal, the kindly hotelier, seeing that the saintly traveller had only two and a half annas, refused to accept payment from him. Venkataraman had only sufficient money to travel by train from Villapuram to Mambalapattu. Upon arrival at Mambalapattu, he walked for 10 miles along the railway track towards Tirukkoilur, reaching Arayaninallur temple as night fell. Exhausted by the long walk, Venkataraman entered the temple and sat in the mantapam adjacent to the sanctum sanctorum. Suddenly, a dazzling light streamed forth and permeated the whole place. Suspecting that this light emanated from the inner sanctum, he got up and searched, but was unable to find the source of this light. Whatever it was, it had disappeared. He returned to the mantapam and plunged into samadhi again. After some time, the temple priests told him that it was time to lock the temple and that he should leave. Venkataraman asked them for some food but was refused. He then followed the priests to the Kilur temple across the river and whilst inside the temple he was lost in Samadhi again. After finishing their duties, the priests roused him but again refused to give him any food. The temple drummer who had been watching the unsympathetic behaviour of the priests, implored them to hand over his share to the hungry youth. When Venkataraman then asked for drinking water, he was directed to a Shastri's house some distance away. Whilst waiting outside the Shastri's house, he fainted and fell down. A few minutes later, he came round and saw a small crowd looking at him curiously. He drank the water, ate some food and lay down and slept. The next day, the 31st of August, was Gokulashtami, the day on which the birth of Lord Krishna is celebrated. Venkataraman decided to pledge his earrings to raise the remainder of his fare to Thiruvannamalai. Feeling hungry, he knocked at the door of Muttu Krishna Bhagavatar just opposite the Kilur temple and requested food. On this special day, the Bhagavatar and his wife were happy to feed the young sadhu. The Bhagavatar also agreed to loan four rupees against the earrings in order that Venkataraman could continue his journey. He also gave him a note with his name and address and told the young sage that he could redeem the earrings at any time. After discarding the note, Venkataraman went to Tirukkoilu railway station where he slept the night upon discovering that the train to Tiruvannamalai did not run until the following day. The next morning, he boarded the train for Tiruvannamalai. This was the last journey he would ever make. On the 1st of September 1896, 
Venkataraman arrived at Thiruvannamalai railway station and proceeded immediately to the Arunachaleshwara temple. Arriving at the temple, he found that all of the doors leading to the Sanctum Sanctorum were wide open and no one was to be seen in the inner sanctum of the Lord. Venkataraman entered the Sanctum Sanctorum and stood before the Linga. He had come home. After leaving the temple, he went to the Ayankulam tank where he discarded the remainder of his possessions, including his sacred thread, and threw them all into the tank. He then tore a small bit of cloth from his dhoti, tied it around himself as a loin cloth, and discarded the remainder. As he left the tank, someone suggested that he have his tuft of hair removed. He agreed and was led to a barber nearby. His physical transformation complete, he set off to the temple again. But before he reached it, a sharp shower of rain bathed him, thus fulfilling the scriptural requirement that one bathes before renouncing the world. After leaving the Ayankulam tank, the young sage returned to the temple where he took up residence in the Thousand Pillared Hall. Venkataraman stayed within the Thousand Pillared Hall for a few weeks, during which time a well-known saint by the name of Seshadri Swami began to take a fatherly interest in the welfare of the young sage, who was now known as Brahmana Swami. A number of youths took a less benevolent interest in him, throwing stones at him and playing pranks. This caused Venkataraman to move to the dark and damp underground cellar known as Patalalingam where the youths dare not enter. During his time there, ants, scorpions and many other insects bit and tore into his flesh. The few weeks that he spent there were a descent into hell, but the young sage nevertheless sat unconcerned, immersed in the bliss of being. Finally, at the instance of Seshadri Swami, he was physically carried from the underground cellar by concerned sadhus. After this, Brahmana Swami stayed in various places within the temple for the next six months or so, during which time a sadhu called Uddandi Nayanar became his attendant, taking care of the bare necessities. In February 1897, at the suggestion of a wandering sadhu named Annamalai Tambiran, Brahmana Swami moved to Gurumurtham, where a devotee named Palani Swami joined the young sage and dedicated the remainder of his life to serving him. Brahmana Swami remained at Gurumurtham and in the adjoining mango grove for a period of 18 months, after which he moved to Pavalakundru Shrine, situated on the eastern spur of Arunachala. It was here in 1898 that his mother, accompanied by his elder brother, found her son after a prolonged search. The mother tried in vain to persuade Venkataraman to return with them. Venkataraman even refused to speak with her. However, after repeated entreaties by his mother, the young sage wrote the following on a piece of paper. The ordainer controls the fate of souls in accordance with their destiny. Whatever is destined not to happen will not happen Try as you may. Whatever is destined to happen will happen. Try as you may to prevent it. This much is certain. The best course, therefore, is to remain silent. Mother Alagamma had no choice but to return home empty-handed. Not long after this, 
Brahmana Swami settled at Virupaksha cave situated on the northern part of the hill. In the 17 years that the sage lived here, many momentous incidents took place. It was here in 1902 that his primary teaching, Who Am I?, was given to an earnest seeker, Shiva Prakasham Pillai. It was here in 1907 that the great scholar Kavyakanta Ganapati Muni had his doubts cleared on the meaning of true tapas. It was the grateful Muni who gave Venkataraman the name Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharshi. It was also here that great devotees like Manavasi Ramaswami Ayer, Echama, Mudaliyar Pati, Ramanath Brahmachari, Gambhiram Seshayar, and the first Western devotee F. H. Humphreys and many others met the sage. Some of them took it upon themselves to serve him. Others received spiritual instruction from him. It was at Virupaksha cave that Sri Bhagavan composed many of his poems, including the famous Aksharamana Malai. It was also here that the Ramanastuti Panchagam, a compendium of five poems, was composed in his praise by the mysterious devotee, Satyamangalam Venkatarama Ayar. Bhagwan also translated into Tamil Advaitic works like the Devi Kalotaram and Adi Shankara's Viveka Chudamani at the Virupaksha cave. During the summer months, due to non availability of water at the Virupaksha cave, Bhagwan took up temporary residence at two caves below the Mango Tree Cave and the Banyan Tree Cave. It was at the Mango Tree Cave that Ganapati Muni, inspired by Sri Bhagavan, wrote his magnum opus, the Uma Sahasram, in praise of the Mother Goddess. Nagasundaram, Bhagavan's younger brother, came to see him for the first time at Banyan Tree Cave, and here he received valuable guidance from Bhagavan. He was told by the Maharshi that everyone who came was equal and that none could claim preferential treatment from him, not even those who had a blood relationship to him. This instruction went straight to Nagasundaram's heart and in later years when he was the Sarvadhikari of Sri Ramanashramam, he faithfully and scrupulously followed this instruction of Bhagwan. After her eldest son died, Alagamma decided to spend her final years with Bhagwan. She had visited him twice in the intervening 16 years on her way to and from Tirupati. Now she had come for good. She joined him at Virupaksha cave. It was she who was responsible for starting a kitchen and cooking on a daily basis for Bhagwan and the devotees. It was during these years that the bond between Bhagwan and visiting devotees evolved into the normal guru-disciple relationship. Because of constraints on the size of Virupaksha cave and the unreliability of the water supply, Bhagwan and his ever-growing number of devotees moved to Skandashramam, which is situated a little above Virupaksha cave and where a perennial supply of water was available. Skandashramam was built by a staunch devotee, Kandasami, and here Bhagwan stayed for a period of six years. During this period, Bhagwan's brother Nagasundaram came to settle permanently at his feet to serve him. He took sannyasa and was given the name Niranjanananda Swami, later affectionately to be referred to as Chinna Swami. On May 19, 1922, Bhagwan's mother Alagamma left the body. She was liberated 
by the divine touch of her son. Alagamma was buried at the foot of the southern slopes of the hill and a small tomb was built over her remains. Six months later, in December 1922, the Maharshi permanently settled down near his mother's Samadhi. The move to the foot of the hill was welcomed by older devotees and visitors alike who found it increasingly difficult to climb the mountain to the caves. In the beginning, the ashram consisted of just a few thatched sheds, including one over the mother's samadhi. A well was excavated at a precise spot indicated by Bhagwan, and even today this well rarely goes dry. Life was very simple in those days. A small thatched room was built for visitors to stay. All who came were treated with absolute equality by Bhagwan. This easily discernible quality, which cannot be faked, exemplified his true Advaitic state and his core teaching that all is only the Self. All kinds of people came to the ashram for Bhagwan's darshan, from kings to the poorest of the earth. None were excluded from his presence and every seeker who came found that their lives were never the same again. In 1927, a hall for Bhagwan to stay and give darshan was built a little away from the mother's tomb and adjacent to the well. Near this hall, an office was constructed and in 1938, a large dining hall and kitchen were built to provide for the increasing number of visitors and devotees. Bhagwan was the epitome of perfection. He brought excellence to whatever he did. He helped the cooks in the kitchen by cutting vegetables, by grinding lentils and pulses. He also gave precise instructions on proper cooking methods, on hygiene and on the quality and freshness of the food to be prepared. He stitched the leaf plates used for lunch and made cups out of coconut shells. He bound notebooks, read proofs, answered questions sent by devotees through the mail, and occasionally he composed new works at the request of devotees. He also translated and corrected classic Advaitic texts. The list is endless. Through all this, Bhagwan sought to impress upon all who came into contact with him the necessity to strive for perfection in whatever one did. This, he maintained, was not only a prerequisite but also an absolute necessity for spiritual progress. The elevated spiritual atmosphere within the ashram continued throughout this difficult period in history. And even in times of apparent material struggle, Bhagwan steadfastly refused to ask anyone for anything, and he strictly forbade others from doing so. But somehow, everything that was necessary for the smooth functioning of the ashram would be miraculously brought by devotees and visitors, even down to the smallest item. This Upadesha served to prove Bhagwan's teaching that God provides everything for those who have truly surrendered to Him. Bhagwan always ensured that whatever food came to the ashram was shared equally amongst all who were present, including all of the ashram workers, devotees, visitors and animals alike. No one received special treatment 
and should anyone even attempt to give Bhagwan more than that given to others, he would refuse to take it. Paul Brunton, a journalist and author from Britain, visited the Maharshi in the early 1930s. The grace of Sri Bhagwan so overwhelmed him that Brunton, upon returning to England, wrote about his experiences in India with particular emphasis on Sri Bhagwan and his teachings. His book, A Search in Secret India, made the Maharshi famous throughout the world and from the four corners of the earth, devotees began to take up the arduous journey to the ashram at the foot of Arunachala. From the early 1940s, the number of visitors to the ashram increased considerably. And yet, even amidst the chaos and catastrophe that enveloped the world during that decade, the ashram continued to be an oasis of peace and tranquility. Many devotees chose to serve Bhagwan in various capacities, carrying out the day-to-day -day tasks within the ashram. Some kept diaries recording the Maharshi's conversations with visitors. Most prominent amongst these were Munagala Venkataramaya, who kept a record of conversations between 1935 and 1939. These were later published under the title of Talks with Sri Ramana Maharshi. Devaraj Mudaliyar kept a diary from 1945 to 1947, later published under the title of Day by Day with Bhagwan. And Suri Nagama, whose letters to her brother from 1945 to 1950 were published in a book form entitled Letters from Sri Ramanashramam. Some chose to write on his life, such as B. V. Narasimha Swami, who wrote Self-Realization, The Life and Teachings of Bhagwan Sri Ramana Maharshi, whilst others like Muruganar composed prose or poetry in praise of him. It was at the request of Muruganar that Bhagwan composed two very important works, Upadesha Undiyar and Ulladhanarpad. Simplicity Humility and a total dedication to spiritual inquiry marked those years at Sri Ramanashramam. The transcendent quality of ashram life was exemplified by the devotion of Kau Lakshmi to Bhagwan and the care and love he reflected towards her. She was the harbinger of the good times to come and of the cowshed that supplies the ashram with pure dairy products. Monkeys, squirrels, peacocks, dogs and many other creatures exhibited an equal devotion to Bhagwan, and His supreme grace was reflected in return. In fact, there was absolutely no difference between man and beast in the way they were treated by Bhagwan.
In 1946, 50 years after Sri Ramana Maharshi set foot in Arunachala, devotees celebrated the Golden Jubilee Advent in a grand manner, with thousands of devotees gathering for the occasion. A thatched roof was put up outside the Darshan Hall for the celebrations, which included speeches and music concerts. Thereafter, the Maharshi often gave darshan to devotees sitting under that roof, which later became known as the Golden Jubilee Hall. In 1939, the building of a temple over the tomb of Bhagwan's mother was begun. It was constructed according to strict Agamic rules and Bhagwan oversaw every detail of its construction. It was completed in 1949 and the Kumbhabhishekam was performed. A perfect monument dedicated to the woman who gave birth to one of the greatest sages mankind has ever known. A Sri Chakra was consecrated inside the Sanctum Sanctorum of the Shrine as a symbol of the Mother. A larger Darshan Hall was constructed in front of the temple and Bhagwan moved there after the Kumbhabhishekam. In early 1949, a small nodule appeared on Bhagwan's elbow. Despite his pleas to leave it alone, devotees prevailed upon him to undergo surgery. Altogether, four operations were performed to remove what was diagnosed as sarcoma, a malignant tumour. After each operation, the tumour returned, 
increasing in size each time, and in the beginning of 1950, it assumed serious proportions. Bhagwan was moved from the Darshan Hall to the small room opposite, where he remained until the end. Throughout this time, an air of fatality pervaded the ashram atmosphere. But even during the last days, the Maharshi continued to give darshan to devotees. Each and every devotee was a recipient of Bhagwan's special grace. April 14, 1950 Devotees sensed that it was the last day they would see Bhagwan in the body. Bhagwan gave darshan that evening. About 500 devotees remained in the ashram, anxiously watching the small room where Bhagwan lay. As the end drew near, a few devotees spontaneously started chanting the Maharshi's immortal hymn, Aksharamana Malai, upon hearing which, a tear trickled from those divine eyes. At 8.47, the breathing simply stopped. There was no gasping, no struggle. At that very moment, what appeared to be a meteor with a cool blue light moved slowly across the sky from the south and disappeared behind Arunachala. The physical manifestation of Bhagwan had passed. He had taken permanent abode as the supreme light in the hearts of his devotees. There was no wild burst of grief amongst devotees, for the Maharshi had prepared them for this inevitable moment. Throughout his illness, he had impressed upon them that he was not the body that Bhagawan was beyond body and mind. 
the true Bhagwan resided in their hearts. Therefore, he was not going away. He said, They say that I am going away. Where can I go? I am here. He did not say, I will be here, but I am here, testifying to the timeless truth that he was none other than the Self in all. Where indeed could he go? For is he not the eternal truth that shines forever? This was the message that Sri Ramana taught throughout his bodily life, that one is not the body nor the mind, but the eternal self that transcends both. His life exemplified this truth. In the days and months to come, devotees found its echo outwardly. Those who came back to Sri Ramanashramam after many months discovered that the Maharshi's promise was indeed true. Everyone felt the powerful presence of the Master, whether one sat in front of his tomb or in the hall where he gave darshan for more than twenty years. It is the same today. Sincere seekers who did not have the privilege of seeing him in the bodily form find that they are indeed in the Maharshi's presence and that he guides them on the path. Those who cannot come to Tiruvannamalai but invoke his presence in their hearts wherever they may be discover that the guidance is no less potent. Bhagwan nurtured in his devotees a love and devotion towards the Arunachala hill. For so deeply had the Maharshi identified himself with Arunachala that devotees perceive in it the physical manifestation of their Sadguru. Circumambulation of the hill remains a sacred oblation with the devotees of Bhagwan Sri Ramana Maharshi and is a potent help in their quest. Sri Ramanashramam today is physically different from what it was 50 years ago. There are more buildings, especially guest houses, to cater to the needs of the ever-increasing number of devotees. A large auditorium was constructed over Bhagwan Samadhi in the late 1960s. A new dining hall has also been added adjacent to the old one. Sri Ramanashramam remains, as Sri Bhagwan willed, a spiritual center where the truly devout could come and pursue their inner yearning for discovering the truth that underlies one's existence. Seekers from all over the world come to Arunachala, to Sri Ramanashramam, to imbibe the peace, to experience the tranquility, to strive for and invoke the truth, ultimately to make it a part of their lives.
Thank you.